Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. Tracy, happenstance has been on my mind a lot lately for a yeah. variety of reasons. Things that are coincidental or um, that people accidentally have fallen into good fortune have just come up in lots of conversations lately for no particular reason I can discern. Um, and I have also had a list brewing for a while of topics that are kind of happy accidents. And so uh, it seemed like maybe the universe was conspiring to tell me to look at that list again. Uh, one category of those happy accidents that I have on my list is accidental inventions. So we are going to talk about a couple of those today. Uh, here's my true confession up front. I had planned to make this uh, three accidental inventions, but the two that we're covering today as I was researching got too big. And so another got cut. Uh, but that means that probably another installment or two of, of accidental inventions will happen down the road. In a wonderful confluence of happy accidents, see, it's all about uh, accidents and happiness. Mm -hmm. Both of these accidental inventions, although one might not have been an accident, we'll talk about that, have to do with cooking and food. So first we'll have a main course, if you will, uh, and if you're nice and flexible in that definition, and then a dessert, but that has a little bitterness depending on how you look at it. You will see what I mean when we get there. So today we're covering two accidental inventions. We'll start with a very, very common household appliance. Microwaves are high-frequency electromagnetic waves, and as it turns out, you can use them to cook food. Here's a very quick and simple explanation of how that works. If you put foods in an electromagnetic field, the fats and water and other elements of the food will absorb those waves and then start to vibrate. They're excited to a point of hyperactivity, and they vibrate so much that it produces heat within the food itself. That's a faster way to cook things than when the heat is coming from an external source like an oven. Right. So usually you'll see people say that it's uh, fats, waters, and sugars that are the primary drivers of that heat. Just as an aside, I wanted to get this out there because I bet people are, like, ready to dash off a, a listener mail. If you have heard that cooking with a microwave destroys food nutrients, that is a myth. Because the cooking time is so reduced, nothing is ever cooked long enough for the microwave radiation to actually destroy any nutrients. And you're also not using any additional water like you might if you were boiling something to cook it. So no nutrients are leaching out into the cooking substance like a water it all just stays right there. You're fine. <laughs> uh, when I was in massage school, one of my massage school classmates insisted that one should not cook with the microwave because microwaves made all the molecules in the food you were cooking spin backwards. And uh, Yeah, I've heard lots of similar myths yeah, over the had, years. We had an argument about that on, like, last day of massage school. <laughs> Uh, even though that is not true, you can get uneven cooking with a microwave when you're heating something up that has different ingredients with different moisture content, and that's why you'll sometimes take something out, find that part of it is still cool, presumably a drier part like the crust, and then another part is blazing hot like a filling. Of course, that means you can't really get something crispy on the outside either. Crisping sleeves help, but you're not going to make fried chicken in a microwave. That's what's up. Uh, this year, while we're recording this, 2022 will be the 55th anniversary of what's usually called the first home microwave oven. Uh, there's actually a precursor, but that's the one that gets all the credit. That was introduced to the market by manufacturer Amana. But that wasn't the first microwave oven, even though it was the first successful consumer one. Industrial kitchens started using them in the 1950s, well before the 1967 debut of Amana's home use radar range. All of this is older than I thought because my household's first microwave was much later than that. Oh, I have plans to ask you all about it. Okay. In our behind the scenes. So radar, as you may recall, detects objects by sending radio waves and then identifying objects when the waves bounce back from the surface of those objects. Radar was first used to create a detection system by physicist Sir Robert Watson Watt in 1935. 
And radar systems require magnetrons to produce all those radio waves. So during World War II, the military needed magnetrons. They needed a lot of magnetrons. They needed more magnetrons than they could possibly get their hands on. Yes, you will sometimes see this contract is happening that we're about to talk about coming from the U.S. military or from the British military. I think after reading a bunch of different versions of it, what had happened was the British military was kind of asking the U.S. to help them as well. And that's how it kind of gets confused there of who actually wanted to contract this company called Raytheon. And there was an engineer named Percy LeBaron Spencer. Spencer was born in 1894 in Howland, Maine, and his early years were really marked by pretty extreme poverty. Uh, He started working when he was still just a kid, taking a job at a weaving mill at age 12 because he had to take care of himself and his aunt, who was raising him at the time. He was a very, very smart kid just a couple of years later. So when he was still a pretty young teenager, Percy, who had no formal education past grammar school, taught himself everything that he could about electrical wiring so he could apply for a job at a paper plant that needed someone to wire the entire factory for electricity. And he got that job and did it. In 1912, at the age of 18, Spencer joined the Navy as a radio operator, and he devoured all the information he could about radio technology And he didn't stop there. He was curious about almost everything, it seems, and he continued to be an autodidact. He taught himself calculus, chemistry, physics, and even metallurgy. He did all of that from books. Later on in life, he said, quote, I just got hold of a lot of textbooks and taught myself while I was standing watch at night. I have such admiration for him. Uh, After World War I had ended and Percy Spencer had fulfilled his enlistment contract, he took a job with a new company, the American Appliance Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In the late 1920s, the company went through several reorganizations and a reincorporation, and it became Raytheon Manufacturing Company. Raytheon, in partnership with MIT that allowed the company to use the school's radiation laboratory, got this government contract to build magnetrons pretty early in World War II, and Spencer got to work. And he did innovate magnetron production. He developed a way to cut pieces needed for assembly from sheet metal instead of needing every single component to be made separately. And he kept working with the magnetrons that Raytheon produced to work on improving them and expanding their uses, Raytheon ended up developing a shipboard radar system and producing about 80% of the magnetrons that were used by the Allies. But the expansion into cooking was really an accident. Yeah, they were defense contractors. They were not like, and food. So the story goes that one day at work, Spencer had a candy bar in his pocket. That was a peanut cluster, according to his grandson, because he used to break up the nuts and feed them to squirrels and chipmunks during his lunches. And after working near a live magnetron with this candy bar in his pocket, he noticed that it had gotten a bit melty. He had not been near a heat source, so he suspected that the magnetron and its radio waves might have had something to do with it. So he got to work and did some testing. The first thing that Spencer purposely targeted with the radio waves was an egg. And after just a brief exposure, the egg exploded. Next, he tested corn kernels. So that's right, he basically made microwave popcorn. After some additional testing and refinement of a magnetron system for cooking food instead of producing radar, Spencer filed for a patent for what he called method of treating foodstuffs. That opens with, quote, my present invention relates to the treatment of foodstuffs and more particularly to the cooking thereof through the use of electromagnetic energy. Yeah, if you look at this story, depending on your source, some people will say the popcorn came first. Uh, His grandson did a, a recent interview last year with Popular Mechanics and he said the egg was the first thing. People's memories are sieves. Could go either way, right. So uh, in this patent application, Spencer goes on to describe all of the various parts needed for the device and how they function together, and then touts, quote, with the system described, I have found that an egg may be rendered hard-boiled with the expenditure of 2 kilowatts per second. This compares with an expenditure of 36 kilowatts per second 
to conventionally cook the same. I have also found that with my system, a potato requires the expenditure of about 240 kilowatts per second when compared with the 72,000 kilowatt seconds necessary to bake the same in an electric oven. These examples are, it is to be clearly understood, merely illustrative. I have observed similar results with other foodstuffs. In each instance where the wavelength of the energy is of the order of the average dimension of the foodstuff to be cooked, the process is very efficient, requiring the expenditure of a minimum amount of energy for a minimum amount of time. He also indicates that cooks will no doubt find many uses for his invention, writing, quote, other objects and advantages of my present invention will readily occur to those skilled in the art to which the same relates. The patent request was submitted on October 8, 1945, and was granted as patent number 2495429 on January 24th, 1950. But even before the patent was officially awarded, Raytheon had started working on microwave ovens, and the first was the commercial radar range, which was named via an employee contest. This was first demonstrated in 1947. A Boston restaurant got the chance to use one as a test. It was the size of a refrigerator, and depending on specific features, it cost between $2,000 and $3,000. It's a lot of money. In a moment, we are going to talk about how that behemoth machine was followed by smaller models and how the microwave became a household standard. But first, we will pause for a sponsor break. Thanks to the commercial microwave oven, it was soon on the minds of many engineers at manufacturing companies that a smaller version of the radar range or a similar device could be marketed for home use. Raytheon partnered with Tappan Stove Company in 1952 to produce a reduced-sized model, and they had one available to consumers in 1955. This is that precursor I mentioned earlier. But it was $1,200 to $1,300, depending on the source you look at far outside the budget of most homes. We always caveat that converting currency through time is a tricky and inaccurate thing, but I looked at several different inflation calculators. They all quoted an equivalency of more than $12,000 in current currency, some quite close to $13,000. So needless to say, the tap and radar range really did not catch on. In 1965, Raytheon acquired a company called Amana Refrigeration, Inc., at the time, they made, as the name suggests, refrigerators as well as air conditioners, and the company had already started working on commercial and industrial microwave ovens. Under Raytheon, the company expanded to include a consumer division, and this meant that not only was Amana already working on a home microwave, but it already had a consumer distribution process that made it easy to get to market once all the engineering and design were perfected. As we mentioned a moment ago, the first consumer model, the RR1 radar range, became available in 1967. That was a 100-volt countertop model that cost a little less than $500, so still very much a luxury item, but much less expensive than that earlier attempt. It had a start button and a timer, obviously not digital, and it did not have a stop or cancel button. You just had to open it to stop it. The following year, a new model appeared with a stop button and a timer that allowed for up to 30 minutes of cooking. That was an addition of five minutes from how long the first model would have allowed. The reliability and the lower cost of the Amana radar range uh, compared to its, its briefly run predecessor made it very popular very quickly. By the middle of the 1970s, it was estimated that one million microwaves were being sold annually. And we really cannot overstate how much of a sensation this was. It was reported in papers regularly. In December of 1968, the daily Memphis, Tennessee paper, The Commercial Appeal, ran an article about microwave ovens that featured a huge photograph of the first Memphis woman to have one. She is referenced as Mrs. Ralph R. Sneed. We don't know what her first name was. And even the delivery man, J.L. Jetton of Jetton Appliances, gets a shout-out for this momentous occasion. Yeah, there's a very cute, like, the delivery man standing there having handed it off, and she's already starting to 
put something in it. Like, I don't, I'm like, are you cooking for the delivery man? I don't know. But it was, seemed very exciting for everyone involved. This article goes on to list the details and capabilities of this, quote, cooking method of tomorrow. And some of these I found extraordinarily charming uh, because when you look at them through today's lens, they're quite witty, so I'm going to read them off. It gave it a, a bulleted list. So number one, the microwave oven is priced under $500. Two, it operates on 115 volts. Just plug it in. Three, it browns meat. We'll cook anything. Four, it saves 75% cooking time. Five, it saves 90% on the fuel bill. It uses less electricity than an ordinary frying pan. Six, it saves on the food bill. Seven, it produces a much cooler kitchen, no heat whatsoever. Eight, foods actually taste better, for natural juices are retained and not lost. Okay, most people would probably agree that the microwave is not really the best way to cook most meals, and whether they taste better or not depends a lot on exactly what you are cooking, but you can see how the idea of a more efficient kitchen that is not swelteringly hot would have a huge appeal and also feel legitimately revolutionary. One of the funnier attributes of the microwave mentioned in that particular article is portability. There's this suggestion that you can take it out on the patio or even into your living room to cook if you wanted. That cracked me up so much when I was reading it, like just picturing putting a meal in the microwave as I sat on the couch. I don't know. I don't know. It just made me crack up. Um, The Honolulu Star Bulletin ran an article of its own in December 1968 under the headline, Microwave Ovens Put the Space Age in the Kitchen. And it offers, in addition to the article itself, a pictorial on just how fast you can make cake in a cup. It shows a user setting the time. It's like this four-part developmental uh, chronological picture thing. So it shows the user setting the time, like a close-up on the hands, And then how the cake looks at 10 seconds and 20 seconds, and then ta-da, done at 30 seconds. The paper's food editor, Betsy Balsley, tells readers, quote, I recently spent a weekend using a radar range for all of the baking and roasting I normally would do in the oven of my stove. It was a fascinating experience. Fascinating is a good choice of words there. It's not really committing (laughs) to whether roasting something in the microwave worked out. Betsy, though, gives a really truthful account of her learning curve, at first overcooking everything because she couldn't adjust to the speed, but she claimed that by Sunday, her third day using the microwave, she'd gotten the hang of it and even cooked a turkey, quote, to perfection in an hour and 15 minutes. So that's a lot quicker than the four hours it would have taken in the oven. Still have questions about how delicious it might have been. Me too. She's honest that anything that needs leavening is just not going to work, but that vegetables, convenience foods, and leftovers all come out perfectly. Yeah, she's pretty balanced in her thing of like, I mean, uh, she says that turkey was great and she cooked a roast in there. Like she did a lot of meats, which I would not usually cook large meat entrees in a a microwave, but she claims it went quite well. Um, These two write-ups and many others like them are, we're talking about them because they show just how excited people were to have an entirely new way of cooking and one that seemed completely futuristic and almost unreal in its speed. The word microwave dates back to 1931. It was used to describe the short waves that are kind of at the heart of this whole story and its technology. And it was used to describe the appliance itself right from when it was introduced. But this method of cooking changed things so much and so quickly that by 1973, so just six years after the Amana radar range came out, the word microwave was being used as a verb. Safety regulations have been in place for consumer microwaves for decades. So, for example, you could put your candy bar right next to your modern microwave while cooking something, and unlike Percy Spencer's experience, it will not melt unless you're kitchen is incredibly hot, which is a situation I've for sure had before. While the microwave certainly won't replace the oven completely when it comes to making things like bread and pie or the grill for things like burgers or steaks, it's just, it's a everyday part of life for many people. I would say every day I microwave something. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and Raytheon technology still exists, focused on aerospace and defense, although Amana is no longer part of the company. Amana was sold to Goodman Global in 1997, and then the company was split into its heating and cooling division, which Goodman retained, and its home appliance division, which was sold to Maytag in 2001. Whirlpool acquired Maytag in 2006, and Amana remains part of Whirlpool, still making a wide range of home appliances, including microwaves. Percy Spencer saw his invention's early success as a consumer product, but not how deeply it became a part of modern life. He died on September 8, 1969, which was two years after the Amana Raider range had been introduced. And now we're moving on to our other invention, which is chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love cookies? Okay, I'm sure some people don't love cookies. I'm not going to judge. I don't get it, but that's fine. Um, but whether you like cookies or not, I think most folks will recognize that the chocolate chip cookie is one of the most popular baked treats to pop out of an oven, old school or even microwave. And like the microwave, they were invented accidentally. Maybe. Uh, there's actually some conflicting information here. But to talk about the rise of the chocolate chip cookie, we have to talk about the woman credited with inventing them, and that is Ruth Wakefield. That is someone we've gotten requests to talk about on the show before. I don't know if they would like how it goes. Uh. <laughs> So Ruth was born Ruth Graves in East Walpole, Massachusetts on June 17th, 1903. She grew up in Easton, Massachusetts with her parents, Fred Graves and Helen Vest Jones Graves. She attended the precursor to Framingham State University, which was Framingham State Normal School Department of Household Arts, graduated from there in 1924. Ruth had a number of jobs early in her adult life after she graduated. She taught high school economics, she worked as a dietitian in a hospital, and she even worked for a utility company in customer service. She managed their customer service team. But she eventually became an innkeeper, really a restaurateur. That happened after she met Kenneth Wakefield and married him. Wakefield had worked in meatpacking. He was an executive when they met. But the couple decided that they would like to run a restaurant together. So they bought a place in Whitman, Massachusetts on Bedford Street, and they started their inn in 1930, which had a very recognizable name, the Toll House Inn. This house had a sign out front that read Toll House Inn 1709. And you will see on occasion write-ups that say that it was once used as a toll house and that it was built in the early 18th century. But that was apparently a quaint fiction that was cooked up by the Wakefields for marketing purposes. The house was really built by a man named Jacob Bates and his brother-in-law, Labeus Smith, in the 18-teens. And it may have been on a toll road, doesn't appear to have actually been used as a toll house. Right. Uh, that's, you know, just, just kind of adding to the mystique. This was, to be very clear, I mean, you've probably already thought this, a dicey time to open a restaurant. The Wall Street crash of 1929 had just happened, plunging the U.S. into a depression. But according to Ruth, she and Ken had always noted the various disappointing things they had encountered when they went out for dinner, and they thought that they could do better. They basically had, like, the dream of the ideal restaurant in their heads. So they bought this building, they renovated it, they burned through most of their investment money in the process. Uh, Ruth later said that they only had $50 when they opened their doors to customers in August 1930. And after just a couple of days of serving only a handful of customers, that $50 had dwindled in supply purchases and one really messy miscommunication where the Wakefields thought they had a large table of paying customers and the woman who brought them believed that they had understood she was bringing her ladies group as a way to help them get the word out about their new business and that it was going to be a comp affair. But within a few months, it had all turned around. By Christmas, they needed to hire 10 more employees in addition to the two they started with. By the end of the 1930s, they had 100 employees, and the seven tables they'd started with had expanded to dozens. They had to add on to the building to accommodate this growing stream of regular customers. 
Many of those people that they were seeing were locals, but a lot were travelers. And for a dollar, diners got a full meal with whatever they desired with it, from soup to dessert. If you wanted seconds, no extra charge. That was all part of your dollar. It was a pretty good deal, but it was also a very nice experience because Ruth Wakefield had extremely high standards. The linens were always perfect, and allegedly wait staff were not allowed to write anything down. They were expected to memorize all orders as part of making the customers feel at home. We'll talk more about Ruth and Ken's restaurant after we hear from one of the sponsors that keeps Stuff You Missed in History Class going. So, for all of its hominess, the Toll House Inn did have a rather stern side, at least when it came to the staff. Ruth was very, very particular in the way everything ran. We mentioned already that servers were not allowed to write down orders. Servers also had a three-month training period to learn the seven-page service manual before they worked a shift on their own. And they only got two tables on a shift. If you have ever waited tables, that's nothing. Uh, But that was because they were responsible for those tables in their entirety, including setting them perfectly with silver placed, quote, one thumbprint away from the edge of the table. Apparently, if you had not done it correctly, you had to clear the whole table and reset it. Ruth was also known to yell at staff that did not perform as expected. And the food had a reputation for excellence. Ruth had a background in food from her college days, and she'd also inherited her grandmother's recipes. She was just a really good cook with a gift for recipe creation. Once the restaurant was successful, she and Ken went on a trip to an overseas location once a year to taste foods of the world and seek out flavors they might incorporate into their menu. The Toll House Inn became well-known enough that all manner of celebrities started stopping in when they were in New England. So everyone from Betty Davis to Eleanor Roosevelt is said to have stopped there for a meal. In 1931, Ruth published a cookbook, Toll House Tried and True Recipes. That cookbook was reprinted 28 times in less than 25 years. I uh, read that ultimately it got reprinted something like 39 times. Don't quote me on that number, but it's in that range. And it grew with each subsequent printing because she would expand and add new recipes they were using at the restaurant. Ruth's recipes, and particularly her desserts, were renowned. And even food critic Duncan Hines raved about her meringue. So how did this lead to a chocolate chip cookie? There are multiple versions. And probably the most commonly repeated version of the story Ruth was improvising. She had run out of the nuts that she usually put in her brown sugar cookie dough or baker's chocolate and added in bits of dark chocolate that she broke off of a semi-sweet chocolate bar. The nut version of the story was told by almost all of her employees and ex-employees for years. Another version was that the vibration of a mixer had caused the chocolate to fall into the cookie batter, And in both of these versions, the batter was baked into cookies, and voila, it was delicious. So there are some other less popular versions of this story, like one that she had run short of butter and was trying to make up the moisture with chocolate. But that and similar tales aren't really supported by any of the accounts given by people who actually worked at the Toll House Inn. There is also a version that says Ruth expected the chocolate to melt into the dough and create a chocolate cookie, but... That version kind of suggests that she would have had some sizable gaps in her knowledge of mixing ingredients, and that makes no sense. Because remember, she had a degree in what was called household arts at the time, and she taught home ec, and she had also just been a really good cook for a long time. There is also another version, Ruth's version, but we're going to get to that in a minute. However it happened, and that mixer story seems like a long shot because it would have dumped a whole or mostly whole bar of baking chocolate into the mix instead of broken apart pieces. Probably still would have been big pieces even after going through the mixer. <laughs> it would have been one giant chocolate <laughs> chip that's eight ounces. <laughs> yeah, regardless of that, a new cookie was born, and restaurant visitors loved it. So much so that if you asked afterward how to make these cookies yourself, you would get a hand-typed card with the recipe from your server. 
The recipe went into the Toll House cookbook in the late 1930s. Yeah, they just got so tired of people asking that they just started typing up recipe cards and having them ready at the start of every shift. (laughs) The restaurant and its amazing cookies were featured on a radio show called Famous Foods from Famous Eating Places, which was hosted by Betty Crocker herself, whose name was actually Marjorie Husted. The recipe and variations on it soon started appearing in papers, and from there, the company known as Lamont Corliss & Company, which was making Nestle chocolate products in the U.S. and eventually became part of Nestle, became interested, in part because their semi-sweet chocolate bars were suddenly being sold in greater volume. They sent a representative to the Toll House Inn, and while Nestle was not the only chocolate company that had approached Ruth and wanted to talk to her about this, it was their chocolate that she liked to bake with, and they struck a deal. This is another point that is told sometimes with some variations, because you might also see it told that Ruth approached Nestle and not the other way around. According to Ruth Wakefield, Nestle paid her a dollar in exchange for the rights to the Toll House cookie recipe. We don't know the exact details of the deal that Ruth and Nestle worked out, but she was shrewd enough not to give up her recipe for just a dollar. Speculation over the years has been that she was given a complimentary chocolate supply for life and also that she served as a paid consultant for Nestle on recipe development as part of that deal. That would make a lot more sense than just saying, sure, for a buck. Uh, If you live in the United States, you have probably seen that recipe printed a bazillion times on the backs of packets of chocolate chips. But for a while, it was just printed on the wrapper of solid bars of chocolate. To add interest and appeal to getting the recipe and chocolate from Nestle, the company started scoring their bars so that they could easily be broken into 160 pieces that were, according to them, exactly the right size for baking cookies. The chocolate morsel soon followed in the early 1940s, so that's when it went into bags in those cute little drops. And soon after that, other chocolate companies were introducing their own chocolate chips, perfect for baking, and often their own cookie recipes as well to try to compete. But Wakefield's Toll House cookie had the benefit of the name recognition that the Toll House Inn had achieved in the decade plus it had been in business, so that kind of continued to reign supreme. Even during World War II, when chocolate was in shorter supply, Nestle used the shortage as a marketing angle. They ran ads that read, quote, now that Nestle's semi-sweet chocolate is harder to get, put it to the best possible use. This ad went on to suggest that women make Toll House cookies to send to their soldiers overseas. Ruth also started selling the cookies from the restaurant to be shipped overseas to troops. This is, according to employees at the inn, when they shifted the recipe to exclude nuts uh, because they just didn't hold up that well in shipping. The recipe that appears on bags of chocolate morsels has actually changed several times over the years as ingredients have changed and things like pre-sifted flour have become readily available. I'm pretty sure the recipe now does have nuts as one example. It might, but gross. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't put them in mine. I will talk about my favorite chocolate chip recipe in our behind the scenes. Um, in 1967, after 37 years in the restaurant business and being very successful about it, Ruth and Ken sold the Toll House in and they retired to Duxbury, Massachusetts. Ruth died 10 years later in 1977. The Toll House Inn burned in 1984, and it was not rebuilt, although the sign has been restored and there is now a historical marker plaque on the site. For a very, very long time, Ruth herself was cagey about how the chocolate cookie was invented. She never explained what prompted the change in the recipe, and in the 1948 version of her cookbook, she even says that it's, quote, really a story by itself, but doesn't elaborate any further. And then suddenly... In 1974, she told a very different story. She told a reporter for the Boston Herald American that it had been very carefully invented, not an accident. In her account, quote, we had been serving a thin butterscotch nut cookie with ice cream. Everybody seemed to love it, but I was trying to give them something different, so I came up with the Toll House cookie. She claimed she had worked out the recipe as they were traveling home from Egypt. She also told a reporter from the Christian Science Monitor that she had worked on the recipe with her pastry cook, Sue Brides, once she returned to the restaurant. 
There was, incidentally, both a nut tea wafer and a chocolate crunch cookie in the 1938 edition of her cookbook, so there is some evidence that backs up her story. But because Ruth was so evasive about it for four decades, and she was known to do some savvy fibbing for marketing purposes, it's hard to know for certain. Incidentally, the original recipe for Wakefield's cookies that was first used in the restaurant isn't quite like the cookie that you'll get if you make the recipe if you find it today. It's a lot less sweet and lighter and crunchier. It was to be baked all the way through and not left chewy in the middle. I mean, why would you not want chewy in the middle? I don't... Ruth, we got to talk about this. Um... (laughs) So that is uh, where microwave ovens and chocolate chip cookies come from. (laughs) Um, I'm suddenly having a a reminiscence about those microwave chocolate chip cookie packs Mm -hmm. when they were introduced, which I think you can still get, but I do not use them. Um... We'll probably have more accidental or not accidental inventions in the future because they're kind of fun. They're a nice uh, uh, refresher after we talk about murder all the time, which I've been doing. Uh, So all of that. I also have listener mail from our listener, Cam, which is going to talk about one of the murders um, or several murders. In fact, Cam writes, hello, ladies. I am a longtime listener and have emailed about transcripts a few times, as many of your podcasts are very useful for my criminal justice class. I feel they're well-researched and they provide insights that students might not get from a textbook, and the material you cover is often barely glazed over. I wanted to write to applaud your discussion about the relationship between crime and media in the Weidmann episodes. I spent a lot of time in class talking about the media and how it impacts how we see crime and criminal justice in the United States. Our perceptions of how dangerous the world is and what appropriate punishment for a crime might be depends greatly on how it's portrayed. I always ask students to think about why a particular victim or offender is getting so much media attention and who is not receiving the same levels of attention. E.g., is one of the victims or offenders attractive? Does the offense violate societal norms and expectations? And what role is race, ethnicity playing in these portrayals? There's a significant amount of research in this area that I won't bore you with, but I'm glad you highlighted this issue. We must always remember that very few media outlets are not for profit and they need to gain an audience, which often occurs through interesting headlines and salacious details preach, Cam. Uh, (laughs) And then says, thank you for all your hard work. I'm including a few pet photos. One is from Luna Ray Cosmos Fluffy Uppy's first gotcha day a few days ago. Our good, good boy, Prince Furry Gronky Bear. These names are spectacular, by the way. Sitting, uh, lying next to his little sister. One of our kittens, Nebula and Aurora, when they were little, it took two kitties to fill the space left by my giant orange basketball of a cat bite. And finally, one of Nebula sitting with her boy. She is the most patient kitty who thankfully also gently enforces boundaries. I hope you're having a lovely day. Uh, Cam gives some episode suggestions and then writes, P.S. I am listening to the Maria Gertrudis Barcelo episodes as I write this and wanted to mention one funny thing. I grew up in Nevada, and my mom was a casino worker, often dealing cards, which is a very common job. When I moved to upstate New York and people would ask what she did, I would use the common parlance I grew up with. She's a dealer. When that obviously confused folks, I would say she's a card dealer, but people would often mishear it and then wonder what vehicles she sold. Never would I have thought about that as being a a locational confusion problem as you move away from that location, but... No. I see how that would go. I was uh, talking to my hygienist about the episode when I got my last <laughs> teeth cleaning, and I think she thought I was talking about drugs. <laughs> right. Uh, Cam, thank you so much. Also, man, those are beautiful pets. Um, mm. Hug and kiss every one of their faces for me. Uh, if you would like to write to us, tell us your funny story about how you accidentally make your mom's career sound salacious. <laughs> Um, or how uh, you are working to make sure people understand that there is nuance in the way stories are told in the media well, any of the, or any of the other stuff. Just send us your kitties and puppies. That's good, too. Uh, you can do that at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on social media pretty much everywhere as Missed in History, and you can subscribe in the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. 
For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.